At this point, we will call the May meeting of the Wood County Board of Supervisors to order. I would ask Trent to please take the roll, and it looks like he has done that. And I would ask Supervisor Hopkamp to please come forward for the invocation. I'd ask the body to rise and then remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This prayer is taken from the Association of Miraculous Metal in Prairieville, Missouri, titled Prayer Entrusting the United States to Mary Immaculate. Most Holy Trinity, you put the United States of America into the hands of Mary Immaculate in order that she may present our country to you. Through her, we wish to thank you for the great resources of this land and for the freedom which has been its inheritance. Through the intercession of Mary, grant us peace. Have mercy on our president and on all the officers of our government. Allow us to have a fruitful economy, born of justice and charity. Protect the family life of the nation. Guard the precious gift of many religious vocations. Through the intercession of our mother, give comfort to the sick, the tempted, sinners, and all who are in need. Mary Immaculate Virgin, our mother, patroness of our land, we praise you and honor you and give ourselves to you. Protect us from every harm. Pray for us that acting always according to your will and the will of your divine Son, we may live and die pleasing to God. Amen. Please join the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with the liberty and justice for all. Thank you. At this point in time, I would entertain a motion on the minutes from the previous meeting, and I have a motion up there by Hamilton, second by LaFontaine. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor of approval, please signify by aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Excusals today, we have none. Resignations, we have none. We have uh, three appointments to the State Wildlife Advisory Committee today for three-year terms, and I propose Nathan Voigt. Jim Winkler and Don Schmutzer. Uh, and we have one appointment or two members to the ADRC Central Wisconsin Board of Citizen Members, uh, Dr. Kathy Meyer and Tony Amernick. Is there any objection to taking these all together? All right, without objection, I'd entertain a motion to approve by Zerflu. I'm sorry, Hamilton's on the board, Wagner seconded. Sorry about that. Any discussion on that? Any discussion? Again, all in favor signify by aye. Aye. Opposed? And that motion carries unanimously. Uh, with the permission of the board, and I spoke to a couple of you ahead of time here, uh, in light of the fact that we are this meeting is being recorded and I think there's significant public interest, we're going to switch this agenda around a little bit. And the first thing we're going to do today is the presentation <coughs> of the jail study ad hoc presentation. Uh, after that, I will allow public comment, and, and part of the reason is I think some of the public comment may be in regard to the jail study and, and what occurred there. So uh, I guess with no objection and further ado, uh, Laura, I call you forward. Uh, this is one of the, the biggest projects, probably the biggest project we've ever done in this county or are looking at doing. I just want to commend uh, the committee on the fantastic work they did on this. They took an extremely deep dive into this, uh, the members of the committee. Uh, Laura, the work you've done to put together the PowerPoint presentation, all the staff people, you know, Sheriff's Department, Criminal Justice Coordinators, you know, Human Service, everybody who's been involved in this process, uh, deeply grateful for the time you've spent working on this. So Laura, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. I know you put together this PowerPoint presentation, so uh, the floor is yours. We'll run through this when we're done. We'll answer any questions, and then we will go to public comment. Thank you. Looks like we're having a little technical challenge. Yeah, me too. I lost my iPad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, while we're waiting, can we please have the rest of the ad hoc committee um, come up front and join me? Yeah. There enough, see? 
Do we need to pull one more? Yeah. Oh, we should have enough. Yeah. 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 very much for your attention, for joining us. Um, the Jail Ad Hoc Committee has been meeting now for several months. We've put a lot of time and work into answering um, some of these questions that have been brought forward. Um, and these are our findings. We have a large contingency of people who are here to help us answer those questions also going forward. So when this project first started, to be honest, I was extremely skeptical myself. Um, felt like a lot of money to spend on something that uh, felt like it could be spent somewhere else. But as we've answered a lot of these questions, I feel genuinely concerned that we've waited too long to do this project and we need to take action on this sooner rather than later. So we tried first to identify um, problems with our current jail and we can put them into five categories. So first of all, um, it is outdated and it has an unsafe configuration. We don't have enough capacity to hold the inmates that we are responsible for in Wood County. We are paying um, lots of money annually in out-of-county housing costs. Our rising insurance costs are becoming burdensome and uh, going to be a challenge going forward. And we have very limited programming space. <coughs> so regarding the outdated and unsafe configuration, we have what's called the linear jail, um, which is the photo you see on the left. That's what you look at when you look down the hallway of the jail. So each corrections officer needs to walk down the hall when they do their checks to physically see into each block or cell. Um, and moving inmates is very time consuming and staff intensive because each person needs to be escorted down the hall. Um, a pod style jail is the f where the corrections and model is going. So you can see in the center on the right, uh, we have one corrections officer or two who can have visibility into all the cells of the um, jail. So they have eyes on all the inmates at the same time. And they're not relying on just um, cameras to try to see everyone. Moving inmates in this situation is secure and efficient. You can open a block and allow the move inmates to move as a group rather than having to escort them all. So the lack of capacity, our jail is rated at 132 beds with a design capacity of 112 beds. So the design capacity is 85% of the um, rated capacity. We have cell beds and dormitory beds. So 39 cell beds and 93 dormitory beds. In 2020, um, we had 121 inmates who were being held in county and 85 inmates who were being held out of county on average. Um, you can see in this chart, this is the graph or the trend of our housing over the last, oh, since 2003. So the bottom section is inmates who are being held um, in, yeah, in county, apologize. Um, then we have the housed out of county is the green and the light blue on top is inmates who are released on electronic monitoring. You can see since COVID and even in the last five years or so, the inmates being housed on elect or being released on electronic monitoring has grown substantially. Um, and that's a program that will continue. However, inmates do need to be eligible for electronic monitoring. So our out of, county, out of county housing costs, we pay $36 a day per inmate in Wapaka County, $35 a day per inmate in Adams County. Um, in Adams County in 2020, we paid $260,000. In Wapaka County, it was $985,000 for a total of 1.2 million um, in 2020. In 2019, it was 1.3 million. Um, and we have contracts with these counties, so even if we don't have that number of inmates there, we are responsible for paying for the beds whether or not they're filled. Um, while inmates are being held out of county, they're not eligible to receive programming. Um, so we don't get to do anything with this time that we have with them. Also, inmates that are being housed out of county still have to book in through Wood County and are released through Wood County. So we bring them back from out of county and then release them here. So at the end of the day, we're still releasing the same amount of inmates um, to our county. Our projected total for 2021 is around $1.3 million, what we'll be spending on housing inmates out of county. Um, and our contracts will be up in 2022. We can expect that the rates will go up to roughly $45 a day. Um, Wood County has had five major insurance claims since 2016. Um, these were suicides in our jail. So these were lives that were lost 
um, which we can attribute to the, this is a very difficult jail to see our inmates, and it's really hard to keep them safe. Um, our current deductible is $25,000 per claim, and we have paid out, two, or the insurance company has paid out $2.263 million in claims for these, um, for these losses. There is one claim, I believe, that's still in arbitration. Our 2021 premium is $417,000, which is up from $317,000, so a $90,000 increase due to our claim history. So this chart shows you our claim hist or our um, premium costs over the last five years. You can see that they're rising substantially. Our claim payouts, the gray bar in this graph shows the um, payouts that were, that were the responsibility of the um, sheriff's department, and the red is the county as a whole. So you can see that the sheriff's department is responsible for almost all of the claim payouts for the county. Um, if losses continue, we've been told that uh, we're going to either need to increase our deductible or we'll have our coverage limited or even canceled. So this could be a major problem if we don't, if we can't account for safety in our jail more thoroughly. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Sarah Saluski now, um, our jail discharge planner, and she's going to talk about our programming. <coughs> Hello, so again, my name is Sarah Sluski. I'm a discharge planner with the jail, so helping connect people to programs and services before they leave. I think it's important to preface that I started this role after COVID, so my only known normal of the jail is how it's currently functioning, and at roughly half the population here in Wisconsin Rapids, I have already experienced uh, space limitations for programs and services, and even meeting with my clients. In jail, we have one library or group space, as you can see on this slide, and when speaking to programming, the ideal number in a class is usually around five to eight people with a maximum of 10. Uh, so when we think about the number of classes in a day, it's easy to think maybe our normal eight hour day. However, after working around our normal scheduled uh, jail activities, that leaves us with roughly about four hours of good time, which is open, unscheduled, uh, that could be used for programming. But then we have to take into consideration our COs needing to transport people from cell box to the library and on scheduled operations and unforeseen circumstances. It is likely in a perfect case scenario that this four hours dwindles down to maybe three 45 minute classes each day during the work week. So just to kind of break down this chart, if you take the three classes a day with a maximum of 10 people in that class, that's 30 people a day times your five day work week, that could be about 150 people who could be served. And we don't have that bed capacity. But this sounds like a really nice number, except that that would essentially equal just 45 minutes for one person a week in our current facility. I chose to calculate on that five days a week uh, between 8 to 4.30 because that is when most programming services I've spoken to are available. <clears throat> now that we've dwindled it down to 45 minutes a week per person for a population of 150, we likely actually have to dwindle that down even more because we did not take into consideration yet the competing demands for that meeting space in our jail. So in addition to the jail library, we only have two small conference rooms that can host two people. Availability of this room is inconsistent due to competing demands of probation and parole agents, attorneys, public defenders, mental health staff, and myself with discharge planning. And they're also used for transporting or isolated situations that arise in the jail. When these rooms are full, they flow over into the jail library to meet those needs. Again, even at half the population here in Wisconsin Rapids, I've already experienced waiting times for those rooms. Prior to COVID, jail staff have stated that there were lines of probation agents and attorneys lined up in the jail just to get a free room. So sometimes COs would actually take these folks down the hallway to meet with people outside of their cell block to sign documents, and they fully expect that to start happening again as the jail opens back up. It's suggested that most people's time in jail should be spent in programs and services to better equip them for re-entry into the community. 45 minutes a week just isn't going to be enough to address individuals' needs, and many programs require more than 45 minutes in a week just for one program. Again, 45 minutes is based on that perfect case scenario, and we know that jail, at least what i found, is a moving target when it comes to timing. More programming space would certainly allow for more classes and for them to run simultaneously so we could increase the dosage of programming available each day and week and their dedicated availability in space. 
Currently in our facility, we have been able to offer some programming through phone call services. This is limited um, because in-person is not happening because of COVID precautions. Some of our partners include Midstate for the GED program, Free Bridges Recovery Peer Mentorship Support for Substance Use, Windows to Work for an Employment Program, and Faith-Based Services, and that's based on interest and the availability of phones. Prior to COVID, AA and NA were also offered, as well as some domestic violence support groups in the jail. However, I am told it was not unusual for these classes to often get canceled because of competing demands for the space and unforeseen events that happen in jails. It's important to note, um, as uh, Laura had stated, that those who are housed in Opaca and Adams County do not receive any programming because they're not eligible to receive other county services when they're our resident, and as well as communication and phones or video conferencing from our facility to Opaca or Adams County is extremely limited or in fact just does not exist. So as a new employee, I'm tasked with linking programs, uh, people to programs and services. So I spend a lot of time talking to community organizations and in conversations, many people are interested in working with our population because they're underserved and generally really hard to reach. This is a list of partners um, who are interested in providing programming, uh, not including our current program list from the private from the previous slide. Getting programming will be the easy part. However, we can't provide it now due to space and other limitations. Evidence has shown that some of the best programming to provide is psychoeducation services that target specific needs, addressing linkages between dysfunctional thought processes, harmful behavior, and overall helps a person better develop skills and tools to cope and thrive in our community. One evidence-based model called Getting It Right, a reentry program, requires at least a minimum of two hours per session, three to five times a week. Going back to that first slide, if we only have one 45-minute class capacity, we cannot do this. For those that completed that Getting Right program, they were two times less likely to engage in criminality when they left, four times less likely to engage in substance use, and ten times greater odds of having employment and housing stability than non-completers. We actually own the materials for this program, but we're not able to actually implement it because we don't have the space availability. In 2019, Three Bridges Recovery, um, a strong partner of ours, implemented the Smart Recovery Program for those with substance use. And for those who completed the program, all have remained in contact with Three Bridges, all have remained in recovery, and none of them have returned back to our jail. The pro both these programs are significant because a recent jail study, a survey that I've uh, been conducting, uh, identified that 65% reported using drugs or alcohol on a regular basis prior to coming to jail. 46% have wanted treatment for drug or alcohol use, but have been unable to get or find treatment options. 45% have no source of income, and 41% state that if they were to leave to jail today, they wouldn't have a permanent place to stay, and that 68% have been homeless while in Wood County at one point in time. I'm almost done. So why in the jail? Why not after they leave? I get that question a lot. Simply put, their basic needs food, water, warmth, and rest, which we all have, are being met while they're with us. For many, without employment and housing, the moment they leave our doors, they go into a constant state of survival mode. They are not thriving. When your basic needs are met, you're able to start focusing on other needs, such as treatment and psychological needs, employment, parenting, you name it. There's time to focus on bettering yourself. These opportunities are not easily accessible once you leave and you can't be reached because you don't have an address, you don't have a phone, you don't have transportation to get to these places, and you're in that uh, state of crisis survival mode. Jail can be more than accountability, it can be re rehabilitative. Or for some who never had these skills to rehabilitate in the first place, it can be a place to learn and build these skills for the first time because you finally have been given the opportunity to do so. Some statistics show that incarceration-based programs are very cost-effective. For those psychoeducation programs I just listed, there's a return on investment of $24.72 for every dollar spent. For education, there's $19.62 for every dollar spent. And for employment, it's around $13.21 for every dollar spent. It also suggests that addressing important needs through jail programming can reduce recidivism, or the likelihood of someone returning by as much as 30 to 40%. 
So while it's sometimes hard to calculate all the moving parts of a fiscal ROI, I think it's important to understand the personal ROI, the return on the individual. Looking at this future list, if we only considered one program under the psychoeducation category at the bottom, our space and availability limitations prevent us supporting, from supporting this program, and that's just one program out of many available. We know people have many needs while they are with us, and more space would allow us to address these needs. We know programming works, but we just don't have a facility that supports it. And we cannot expect to reduce recidivism rates and help people if we don't provide programming and support services. So to conclude, thank you for letting me bend your ear for a little bit. Our current programming is limited because we just don't have the available space. There's inconsistency of our available space because of competing demands between myself, probation, uh, attorneys, mental health, other needs. There's limited duration and dosage because we only have one room. Nothing can run simultaneously. And our current space is very labor intensive. So while we had all those hours in the day, we dwindled it down pretty quickly because also staff need to transport people back and forth consistently. So programming interventions will be an essential component to reduce recidivism, increase community safety, reduce costs, and have uh, impact the overall health and well-being of our community and its residents. So I'm going to introduce John Kane from Venture Architects to talk about the proposed new design. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, hopefully, at this point, I'm a familiar face to most of you. Um, been here for many years and <coughs> been playing an active role working with the ad hoc committee, and I'll speak briefly to that in just a moment. Kurt, well, why don't you introduce yourself? Morning, Kurt Brunner from the Samuels Group. Um, we've been working in concert, helping develop the concepts you'll hear here this morning, as well as the budget estimates that will be shared as well. Uh, this first slide highlights a number of important aspects to the, the project. Um, I have a number of other slides that you'll see here in a minute that I'll explain in more detail. But essentially, this proposal is a new freestanding 225 bed jail. So at opening, it will have 225 beds. It has the capacity to be double bunked up to 300 beds. Um, and that uh, the space to allow that to happen will take place in the, in the size of the building and the size of the cells. It also includes a brand new sheriff's department and garage areas. Uh, the budget information that we will share with you today includes also the demolition of the existing jail that would allow the, the future construction of any future county government buildings. So not the cost of that new building, but the cost of the demolition is included you know, in this budget that we will see. Um, a really high important consideration in this particular design, and we went through a number of iterations over the last six months, is there's no residential land acquisition required, and that's a really important consideration as we move forward. There is, the Avon Street will have to be acquired, because as you can see from the diagram, the building sits right on top of Avon Street. So that's just a quick overview of the building let me try to explain a little bit more about the design and I'll try to keep it at a high level just to keep the, the conversation moving forward. As mentioned earlier, this will be a podular design. So that part of the plan that you see with the, the light colored tan represents the housing, this being the top floor of the building, these are dormitories. The officer station is the red, the green is circulation. You've heard a lot about programming space today. Each of the floors of the jail will have programming that's represented by the blue color that's right in close proximity to the housing. So the movement of offenders is, is very direct and in fact many times does not even require staff direct involvement because they can see that, that movement taking place. So uh, to answer the discussions and the concerns about space for programming, there will be ample programming space on both of the floors of the jail. The red represents circulation, stairs, elevators, etc. The little bump out on the bottom of the slide is, is the green sally port that faces onto Market Street. The green to the top is the new sheriff's office, and it's, it's a several-story building. I'll explain that in more detail. 
The courtyard is now being filled by two levels. A lower level and closed level will be for sheriff's parking. And then on the top of it, the roof will be surface parking for sheriff vehicles as well. So that's just a quick overview of the plan. Um, this is what it might look like diagrammatically. So I apologize, the building will not be green and tan as much as that might be quite nice. Um, you're supposed to laugh. Come on, guys. <laughs> You will see later on, there's a slide of Eau Claire County. Uh, I, we did that project a number of years ago, and I think the point of that slide and what I, the point I want to make here today is this building will not look like a jail. It can look like an office building. It look, can look like a courthouse. It has the ability to not have that jail-like appearance. You will not see jail windows um, in this design. So this would be southwest looking northeast. You can see the existing courthouse in gray to, to the left, Market Street in front of that. And so then this is the four-story building. Green is going to be the surface first level. That's the sheriff's office and all the jail support. That includes the sally port, the booking area, food service, laundry, things like that. The, the, the orange part represents really three levels. The first, the, the second, and the third levels is a pod where it's a two-story design. Some of you toured Eau Claire and you then have an understanding of what that is. <laughs> That's where all the cells will be. And then the top floor will be the dorm construction. So they're actually, in fact, four stories to this building. So that's one view. This would be a similar view from the southeast, looking too soon, looking northwest. You'll see the, the green now representing the sheriff's office on several levels. There's a basement level and two more levels. And so you can see how this fits into the existing campus. In this particular slide, you'll see the gray outline of the existing jail. As I noted a moment ago, the demolition of that building is included in our budget numbers today. So what, might, what that might allow in the future would be a consideration that once that building is gone, that space could be used for parking, or maybe years to come, maybe that becomes a place for future county government facilities. Uh, River Block, 25 years from now, as a possibility. Uh, Donna, that's consideration. <laughs> so, uh, you know, what we're trying to do is not only solve the jail issues, but all the master plan future space needs for the county and, and for many, many years to come. Um, again, very diagrammatic. This is Market Street. You'll see gray on the left, which is the courthouse. The new building is to the right, and the Sally Port is, is out on Market Street, so that would be looking in one, one direction. This might be another direction. Again, that's Market Street. That slide there. We go up to Fifth Street, and here's Fifth Street with the houses to the, to the south, um, and then the, the Sheriff's Office there in, in the beige color. And then in the future, another office building for the county might look then something like that. So, quick update on the design and the concepts. Kurt, you want to speak to the budget information? Sure. Morning, everyone. I just want to give you a, a brief, brief background on who I am and why I'm here. Um, Kurt Berner from the Samuels Group. We are a construction management firm that does uh, a lot of government correctional work, county correctional work throughout the Midwest. Uh, John had asked me to help him with some budgeting. Uh, the committee was uh, kind enough to let me sit in on a couple of their meetings. And I just want to commend the committee. They took, I think the term was a deep dive. Um, I've been involved in multiple projects and this committee did a lot of homework. Uh, and, and I'm very impressed with what they're presenting to you today and, and thankful for the opportunity to kind of give you um, the information here. but. The numbers that are before you here represent, we've broken it down into um, a couple of categories and obviously construction costs would be the numbers you would get from contractors on our bid day. Okay, so those will be bids that would come in from contractors and then we've got a non-construction, sometimes we call it a soft cost, uh, soft cost for the project which would be contingency, we would carry constructing contingencies, there's professional services, there's permitting fees. Um, there's multiple things that are in that soft cost that you're going to have to pay to get that, that those services done outside of the construction numbers. And those two combined, combined get you to a project cost of that $56 million that you have before you. We're doing this as a projection if you would bid the project out in spring of 2022. 
which would mean if you would approve it here this year, uh, John's team would uh, need some time to put the uh, the construction documents together before it could hit the hit the streets for contractors to bid on. A couple of things that I just want to make you aware of uh, before we close on this slide is that I did look back at uh, 2001. DLR study, which was another firm that did a, a jail study, and maybe some of you are, are familiar with that 20 years ago. And they were referencing a 298-bed jail at that point, uh, which still identified that you had that need uh, that long ago. And they identified that at that time, it would cost you about $23 million. And you might go, why is it $23 million in 2001, and it's $56 million, and we're talking about the same project. The fact of the matter is, is that construction costs never go down they always increase. And they increase at a rate of about 4 to 8%, okay? And I did kind of a long range projection. If you would decide not to do something now, you can roughly add about $3 million, and it depends on every year it adds up. You've got to take that 4 to 8%, and I did it on 4.5%. Um, it's pretty simple math. Just add that 4.5% onto your $56 million by delaying it a year, and you didn't change anything in regards to the scope of the project. It's just that the cost of construction uh, goes up. Um, now I know probably most of you have went and bought plywood right now, um, and the, the price of plywood is three times what it was a year ago. Obviously, we're not constructing this facility out of plywood, um, but there are increases that are associated with material. Um, but what's happening in the market right now is that contractors need work. Uh, coming out of the pandemic, we have contractors that are putting competitive numbers. They can't control the material, but they can control the labor side of that. So when you combine the two of them, some of those competitive labor numbers are offsetting some of that material increase. And through the design process, you would work with John's team to identify what construction materials you'd use. We're actually working with John on a couple of other projects and we've shifted precast away from steel because you want to be able to balance that steel market. So there's ways that you can mitigate that potential increase um, and uh, that would be a process that if you did approve the project, that's what we would do to be able to mitigate some of those material increases. So thank you for your time. some of the older stuff like it, they had just talked about where there was the three pod design or current design which we have right now is linear um, but during those discussions it came up that maybe if we made the footprint a little differently and did a two pod it would obviously start saving and as you can see at the top of this slide you'll see the two pod for staffing what this is is a, an idea of what those types of labor things would end up being from where we currently are which you'll see we have the number of staff at uh, 22 and that it would take approximately 30 people to operate a facility this size. That would be an increase of eight crew members for the jail staff. Uh, the top, it kind of shows where they are. Some of these are already existing staff. Uh, and then it shows where we fit all these people in and what jobs they would actually be doing for Wood County during that time. Um, the second part right below that, you'll see number one, Monday through Friday. This is where we started taking a look at what we currently are having, which is we have two people that run our transport team right now, two full-time people that are corrections officers. And that's because they may split up going this way, they take part-timers with them, so it's labor intensive. You have to have enough people to move everybody to Wapaka, everybody to Adams, all of them back, and then you still have to go pick up all the warrants and all the other things that were still are responsible throughout the state of Wisconsin. So this would show that we would then transfer all that staff back to our working staff, back to house and actually work on those crews, keeping one of those people full-time so we still have that consistency in getting people to and from where they need to go, not just while back in Adams. Um, maintenance staff, we did look at this as uh, if you build things, they, they are nice and they work really well sometimes. Even the new construction can have some problems and you still have to have somebody on it. Adding that many square feet, you, we thought it would be important to actually add another staff member to maintain that so we can keep it running up to work for quite a long time. Um, on the side of with the annual costs, the current jail operates at about $4.1 million. 
That does include the two or the 1.245 that we are using for housing. Additional staff would be the $666,000, which is a reduction of about 585, I think it is. Right around $585,000 less for the staff, so that gives us a reduced cost for operating the newer facility at $3.5 million. Good morning, uh, Ed Newton, Finance Director. With me I have Justin Fisher. Uh, he's the Director of Public Finance for Robert A. Beard & Company. Uh, Beard has worked with uh, Wood County at our other CIP bonding projects, so he's very familiar with, with Wood County. The first slide kind of discusses our financing, but um, Justin kind of worked on this. I will turn this over to Justin. Thanks, Thank Ed. Justin. Well, I got to introduce this project uh, a few years ago uh, when we first started talking about it. And, you know, they, the groundwork was, this is going to be coming up. We need you to start planning for it now. And that was many years ago. And so when I got the call in summer of last year to take a deeper dive into the, how are we going to finance this if we want to do this project? It was a lot of thought, a lot of strategy, a lot of different financing options, a lot of virtual calls over the last year um, to come up with ultimately a very good strategic plan where I'm extremely confident we can hit these tax impacts that we're presenting here today. Um, so, so we wanted to be strategic in how to get you the funding up front so you can start paying for project costs and then ultimately giving, giving the county the flexibility to take out a construction note uh, when you're ready, when you have more project costs finalized, there could be federal money coming in um, later on in the process. Interest rates are still at historic lows. So we want to take advantage of borrowing on a short-term, uh, low-cost basis until more information is known and lock in when we're ready, um, ultimately hitting the tax impacts that we, we've been tasked to do. So in this financing illustration, there's a lot of numbers in here. But ultimately, when you look at the left side of the page, that's your existing debt service. Then we go into the construction note, and then ultimately taking it out when the timing is right. The target here is, we know that the county has future capital investments you would like to make. And so we need to factor that into this overall plan of finance. So that's what I did, is I planned for the county borrowing for future capital needs you know, about three and a half million dollars every year thereafter. And still with that, we're able to hit a 30 cent tax impact in 2022, and then an additional five cent impact in 2024. So that would be the max impact is a total of 35 cents per thousand on the valuation to a taxpayer. Then in 2027, that's when you see drops to the mill rate. There's about five cents on average of a tax rate drop. That accounts for those future hypothetical projects that we know the county is probably going to need to do at some point. So it lays in a nice overall plan that says, you can do this project, you can also do future capital needs. You're not gonna be uh, tied up in the future where you can't potentially do something uh, because the tax rate's gonna continue to increase every time we do something. This is it, 35 cents. Assuming you stay around that three and a half million dollars in capital needs every year. Because if you can do that, this plan will come together very nicely. Also, the interest rates that we're using in here are pretty are conservative. Um, in the marketplace today, we would be less than what I'm showing today. But, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into that. Um, right now, there's there's talks of you know, increased capital gains tax, uh, you know, income tax and so forth. Municipal bonds are highly sought after when taxes for individuals go up because ultimately you get a tax incentive for buying municipal bonds. So there's demand for municipal bonds, which has kept interest rates extremely low. Um, and, and we see that kind of happening for the next uh, several months that interest rates will continue to stay low. and. When you, when you think about 
the project and what this long-term financing may cost. You know, historically speaking, say an interest rate is at around three and a half to four percent, and we're closer to two, two and a half percent. You're talking about millions upon millions of dollars in taxpayer savings by locking in at lower cost financing than higher cost financing. So now is a great time from an interest rate perspective to be talking about this project and seriously considering it. Also, if you look at um, currently, if we do do this borrowing, you'll still see that uh, Wood County would have the capacity to still borrow over $200 million. So it's not like we're hitting a close to our threshold. And that's pretty much based upon our um, equalized valuation, and we're anticipating a growth of about 2.5%. Yeah. So, right. and, and in this slide, this again accounts for the jail potential project plus the, the hypothetical future capital improvement borrowings of $3.5 million every year thereafter for the next five years. Um, some of the goals that we're, we're looking at when we're working on the financing, we want to you know, try and keep the mill levy as low as possible. Uh, doing this, we're, you know, we're still looking at about 30, um, 30 cents in 2020 and an additional 5 cents in 2024 uh, per 1,000. So what that means is basically, you know, 30 cents would equate to uh, $30 per 1,000. $100,000 house valuation. And also, as Justin reached out back in 2020, by 2027, you'll start seeing the reduction in the mill rate, and that's based on hypothetical future CIP borrowing and thereafter. Um, providing the flexibility to reduce our long-term debt. You want to speak on that? Yep. So, so what's nice about this is you will get the money up front to start paying the, the invoices that are going to come for, for this project. We may not lock in the long-term borrowing till end of the year when more information is known. Because ultimately, we don't want to borrow on a long-term basis more than what you actually need. Because then you're stuck with that for a long-term basis. So we want to have all the information we, we need um, to then go out to the market uh, and lock in the long-term debt. Because again, we, we don't want to do that before we know more information. And, and, and it's, it's basically thinking about also balancing what are interest rates going to be doing over the next six months. If, if we see interest rates starting to increase, we may say, let's lock in earlier rather than later. So we, we need that flexibility to evaluate all the different factors that go into ultimately getting you as the county and your taxpayers the lowest overall cost financing uh, available. Thank you. And also, when we look at the, the borrowing, we want to make sure we include our local banks in this process. We want to try and keep the money you know, locally within the county if we can. Also, we will look towards local contractors, again, trying to keep the, the money that we spend locally in Wood County. So we will do our best to try and you know, try and keep as much as we can local. Uh, the earned money that we spend uh, on the bond proceeds, we can use that towards the jail. So even though we borrow a large amount, we can invest some of that too and use that money to pay some down. I think uh, early when was looking at about possible return about $90,000 or so. Yeah, I mean, interest rates on the short, short term basis are just low. Um, you've seen it in your bank accounts and so forth. Uh, you're you're not earning a ton, but when you were going to be borrowing for this construction note, you're also not going to be paying a lot on, on that. I mean, that's looking at around one percent for for that. So I mean, it's it's it kind of negates itself um, in, in a way. And talking, um, we will be able to spend down the money within the three years, and that'll keep us in compliance with uh, the tax exempt status of the borrowing. And Justin, Justin can talk about uh, the data on, on this, showing how the interest rates have gone down. Yeah, I, I think this is really kind of a good visual to see what interest rates have done over the last 30 years. Um, you know, when you, when you look at it, 
many, many years ago, they were pretty consistently high. And then over the last really 10 years, we've seen the rates drop. And then the pandemic hit, and you can see there's that spike there because ultimately the financial markets froze up um, at, the, at the beginning of, of last year. And, and it took a while for the markets to kind of calm down. There was also a lot of money pumped into the, the economy to get things moving again. But then it became, a, what's a safe investment during uncertain times? And that's municipal bonds. And so you can see that rates dropped pretty dramatically <coughs> come June of last year. And they've stayed at that historic low uh, over that period of time. And, and you know there is more increased optimism every day with the pandemic um, and things getting better, but that's you know th we're we're seeing a lot of more positives in the United States. When you think about globally, things are still very uncertain, and and so where's safe investments? The United States, and, and so you're seeing a lot of uh, investors that want to buy, you know, s strong, secure municipal bonds and the county is one of the highest bond credit ratings you can buy so it's keeping it's going to be a good demand for, for your bonds and just kind of reiterate um you'll see the maximum mill impact about 35 cents per year per 1000 and that includes the jail as well as the borrowing on the 3.5 million on the cip and as we talked before that you'll see the decrease after about five years um and just kind of a quick little stat that wood county ranks about 49th out of 72 in the uh, medium property tax for wisconsin so uh, wood county does have one of the lower property tax so now would be the time even if we did borrow looking how it would increase us with the other uh, counties i think we would just jump one to 48 so it would be very minimal impact compared to the other counties in Wisconsin. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so we'd like to talk a little bit of what the local impact on our community will be. Uh, by seeking involvement from local service providers, we can make sure that we borrow locally, like uh, Dustin and Ed had mentioned, and have local construction contracts, increasing um, engineering support for the building that we have. We'll have nine new jobs, eight corrections officers, plus one maintenance staff. Um, our goal would be to keep money in Wood County instead of paying for out-of-county bed. So right now, that $1.2, $1.3 million annually that we're spending to house inmates out of county is going to fund those counties. So the goal is to turn off that faucet and keep that money here. And the other positive is that all inmates would be receiving programming. So like mentioned before, inmates who are in other counties do not receive programming. So we'd be improving the incomes of inmates who are released in Wood County, regardless of where they're housed. So what if we do nothing? Um, this would have a three factor uh, issue that we'd be dealing with. So we have an economic factor here, which will include our bed rental costs and our capital costs, an operational factor and a physical factor. So the economic factor would be, again, continued bed rental costs um, and increased contract rates going forward, looking more at that $45 a day um, bed rental rate. And that's for your average inmate. That doesn't include maybe a high needs or a special needs inmate. Those rates can vary wildly, but depending on the um, facility. Um, the transportation and staffing time and costs are going to continue to be what they are and go up. Um, right now, like Ted had mentioned, we are spending money and transportation time to bring these inmates back and forth for court dates to um, out-of-county housing, and again, not receiving programming. Um, we're going to experience continued liability and increased insurance premiums, and the maintenance on our facility as it is now um, are going to go up. We'll talk about that in a minute, but we do have some serious maintenance concerns on our current facility. Also, some of the projects that we need to do would require vacating our jail, which would mean that we have to house all of our inmates out of county for that time period. So what if we do nothing? We're going to bring Ruben forward. Ruben is our um, maintenance director, and he's going to talk about some of the 
uh, facility problems we're dealing with right now. Good morning, everyone. So the question, what if we do nothing? Um, my initial thought on that is that unfortunately that's not an option. We can't do nothing. Um, if we choose not to build a facility at this point, we need to commit to the facility that we have. And that means um, some substantial investment in the coming years uh, to maintain our current facility. Uh, the older part of our current jail dates back to the 1950s. Um, and then the rest of it was uh, added on to when there was some additional square footage from the 1980s. So most of our equipment dates back at least to the 80s. Um, some of the systems um, have roots into the 50s. And I'm not sure how many of you have older homes, older vehicles, uh, but if you think about our jail, and it runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it does not stop. Um, systems that are that old need to be updated occasionally. If you had a car from the 50s, probably it's not gonna still have anything original that you know, the hoses, the belts, you're going to have a lot of money stuck into that. So we're looking at the same thing here. If you look at the screen in front of you, uh, that highlights some of the projects that we need to plan in the next five years. Uh, stretching it out farther than that will have a significant impact on the facility and its operation. Um, so I'm not going to talk in detail about all of these, um, but just some of the highlights. Look at the cost, you know, for our, our HVAC system, the first line. Uh, could be up to $1.5 million to update that system. Um, it's not just that it's old and needs to be replaced, it's also inefficient, it's older technology. Um, we need to update that uh, to improve efficiency, to improve climate, to make sure that we're turning over air properly in our facility according to new standards. Uh, working through some of the other items, um, pneumatic to DDC controls, just real briefly, uh, most of the thermostats and controls for climate in the GL are operated by air pressure with a compressor. Uh, it's not efficient, it's not as reliable as today's direct engine <coughs> controls, that's what we'll be looking to put in. Um, boiler, just like your furnace at home, they don't last forever. Uh, generator and ATS, so we have backup power, again, because the jail operates 24 hours, 7 days a week. Um, we need a reliable generator, we need um, automatic transfer switches and equipment that can make sure we have power, make sure the lights stay on if there's an issue with um, electricity outside the building. Um, security control system replacement. That's a big number, almost a million dollars we could be spending on that. Now that's not just security cameras, that's not just an alarm system. That is controls that power and monitor all of our doors uh, that are powered. So the, just like you see on TV, the big sliding doors, uh, those are powered by very old controls, old components that need to be replaced and updated. Uh, plumbing fixture replacement and in-floor cast iron at the bottom. Um, large number, totaling almost $2 million in plumbing upgrades. Uh, some of our in-floor plumbing dates back to the 50s. Uh, some of it is from the 80s, but it's all cast iron. And cast iron doesn't last forever. In the last few years, we've started replacing sections of that cast iron. It's costly and it's disruptive. So this is one of the projects that would be an issue in the jail because if we replace all those lines, we have to vacate the jail during that project because the hallways would not be accessible to staff or inmates. Uh, that's going to be a problem. So again, I'll talk at length with anybody that wants uh, after the meeting or another time, pick my brain, ask me about this. I've been here about five years. Uh, we've started working on some of the issues that we have, but there's a lot more to come. As I said, in the next five years, everything on this list is going to be worked into capital. Um, it goes beyond that though, so let me tell you this, that if we spend this five or six million dollars to fix the current problems that we have in our jail, that's just to stay as is. So that's really, again, when we say do nothing, we can't do nothing. This is a bare minimum, and that doesn't address some of the other concerns that you've heard about this morning that you'll continue to hear. Um, there's efficiency problems, there's safety problems, there's liability problems, um, a lack of programming. So. Just what you see on the screen would do nothing for any of those issues. Something to keep in mind. Thank you. <laughs> I don't have the clicker, so I won't turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> I do. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Just making sure I'm not sitting there. Um, in this slide here, um, Janelle can talk to uh, parts of it. Um, I guess we'll start with you. Yeah. Right. 
Um, so if we do nothing as it relates to inmate programming, um, I think it's interesting in that it would seem that things stay the same. But what we actually know based on evidence is that if we do nothing as it relates to programming that is offered to the inmates of our jail, our recidivism rates are likely to increase. So if we are not providing programming that specifically addresses the criminogenic needs that folks have while they're in our care, there's a direct correlation between return to incarceration every single time somebody is incarcerated. So each time someone is incarcerated, if we're not responding to their needs, and again, those are criminogenic needs, substance use and mental health concerns are criminogenic needs, but are not, um, they don't encapsulate the totality of criminogenic needs, then our, again, recidivism rates will continue to increase. Well, and, and as we move forward, so in dealing with programming, um, it also has brought up some interesting things along with the uh, current Wood County Jail. If, uh, people have come down into our lobby, you'll see little chairs and booths sitting along the wall and there's a little hallway behind them for people to get to those chairs. COVID has kind of shut that completely down because there's no way to keep anybody six feet apart. Even if you put one on one end, one on the other, they still have to pass, so they, they can't use the room. Um, we're currently in the install phases of putting in video visitation, so at least we can start to utilize these things. We can start getting communications from the inmates back out to have those family visitations. It's not just important for them to do it, it's also part of the DOC in order to allow them to have communication with people to keep those bridges through the community, to keep in contact with their family and friends, and hopefully not transition into homelessness when they lock out our door. In these current spaces for our uh, under DOC 350, we'd also looked at, say, in the northern part of our jail, where there's a lot of bars in that part of the facility. Uh, we looked at it one time, even removing all those. I know I talked to the DOC in reference to that. Um, there wasn't going to be a big issue in it, but when you start modifying the inside of the jail in order to make it more modern, it's about the footprint at that time, and you start have to follow <coughs> The new footprints for each inmate is what it was back in the 80s. It's no longer that. It's a little larger space for the individuals, and there's more things that you have to add to it. So in addition to tearing up the floor, you also have to be tearing out some of those walls. And, you put it at, and one of the um, slides that we were looking at earlier, and when we were looking through the planning, one was modifying the inside of the jail to keep it, and then building up a jail right next to it so we could get the bed space we need. But in doing that, Following the current DOC, we dropped that from 132 down to about 80 beds. So modernizing it would, again, make us have to help more out. So it is kind of what it is. So that we move to the next slide. And here, as we were talking a little bit about some of the things that are wrong with our facility, one of the glaring things that we have is on our sally port. At the time when they constructed it, it worked just fine. The ambulances were smaller, all the transport vehicles, people coming in doing work for us in order to get inside the facility. We like to close the doors so we can control the actions going on around it, even temperature if we're talking winter. But in the current facility, we can no longer get an ambulance inside. There are transport vehicles that will bring us prisoners from out of state where we utilize uh, these corporations to bring us our inmates as opposed to going there. Their vehicles no longer fit it. We have dents in the ceiling to prove it. But uh, it is kind of interesting that over time our vehicles have gotten bigger and we can't really change the sally port. And you look on the one image in the top and you'll see that they're stairs. So currently, because we added on to the jail that was 1950, it created a height difference inside the facility, which then has the stairs and the ramp. In and of itself, if we're walking around, is not a big deal. When we start having emergencies, another thing that's also grown is our the gurneys or the actual stretchers that they wheel up they're all automated and self-lifting they don't make the corner anymore so they actually hit the metal bars trying to come out of the door so we have to have both doors open to the outside we have to have the garage door or in our sally port open because the ambulance can't get in so literally the entire jail is wide open in order to get somebody out in an emergency and you wouldn't think it happens too often but a lot of our individuals do have health needs. They come in, they're on various self, they're self-medicating. And when they get to us, they start coming off these things and the health problems start to come back for us. So it does happen quite regularly where we have to take people out. Um, as I said, the garage doors aren't large enough 
inside that Sally Port area where you can see where the trash can is sitting. That is now our new pre-booking area. So when people come in because of COVID, we didn't want them to come into the jail. We're still actually booking people in standing in the garage. And that's just so that we can make those health assessments prior to bringing people inside the facility. Um, and the one where you see the two individuals standing or the one standing on our nice little footprints on the floor, that's where we book people in. That's where we release people. So everybody that comes to the Wood County Jail stands in a little square. Everybody that leaves the Wood County Jail stands in a little square. Anybody going through any medical appointments, seeing their attorneys or anything else in that area crosses in that exact area all at the same time. So it makes it rather a congested area to try to do some of the things that we need to do on a daily basis. So in that individual standing there, he'd be being booked in, he'd be wearing green. So we're, we're getting him ready to come into the jail. We'd also be releasing somebody from that same spot, but it seems kind of interesting that of the 206 people we had last year during COVID, every one of them stood there. All of them that went to our Wapaka or Adams County all come back and stand in that square and get released right out the front doors. So we're not asking to, I guess, increase the number of people at the Wood County Jail. We're just trying to have a place to store them so we don't have to open the doors on all sides. Thank you. So we've put together an estimated cost comparison um, for the stay as is option and the proposed new jail, trying to take into account the changes that we're going to experience over the life of the bond, which is 20 years. So if we stay as is, our needed repairs and updates are around 5.5 million. Our safety, liability, and efficiency improvements are around 20 million. This number is really hard to estimate. It includes the things that Captain Ashback had mentioned. It also includes the cost of having to vacate our jail and hold people out of county, and the cost of what's going to happen when we reduce, if we were to reduce our jail capacity down to 80 and increase our costs for out of county housing because of that. It also includes the bed rental and transportation over 20 years. This is based on the number of $45 per day at 90 beds. So this is not including the additional um, numbers we've been talking about. Which puts us at a total stay as is cost of over 20 years of almost $58 million. The proposed new jail, you've seen these numbers a little bit ago, 46 million, 46.8 for the construction, 9.3 for the non-construction costs. The additional staff that we would have to hire, the nine staff that we talked about, would have an impact of $13.2 million over 20 years. And so the total project cost with the 20-year bond would be $69 million, 69.4. So you can see it, it is higher than stay as is, but we do have the benefits of being able to rehabilitate our residents here where they are. Um, before I introduce our guest today, we also would like to point out as um, John Kane had mentioned earlier, this was a project that they did about 10 years ago, the Eau Claire County Jail. And you can see this is what their jail looks like. It doesn't look like a jail, it's a beautiful building. So we would aim for something like this. We aim to match our courthouse. We have a lot of leeway as far as what the building itself looks like. So I'd like to introduce Captain Dave Rivestall. He's the Eau Claire um, County Security Services Captain. Um, and they went through this project very recently, very similar to ours, almost yearly so, downtown, on the river. <laughs> Giving away all my talking points. <laughs> I'll let you take over, thank gotcha. you. All right, good morning. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak in front of you today. Um, it's been a long time since I had a chance to speak with people in person. I'm used to the computer screen and muting and who's not muted. Um, so this will be my first time talking to the actual people in a building, it's, a, it's amazing, and I'm glad that we're doing it. Um, as I was mentioned, my name is Dave Rivestall. I'm the captain and jail administrator um, for the Eau Claire County Sheriff's Office. Um, and I'm going to be speaking from, from my point of view as a jail administrator. Um, it's not meant to be critical of what Eau Claire County did or didn't do, um, but truly an assessment from my point of view. Um, I come in peace, so um, <laughs> I hope to share a little bit about what we went through um, for a long time similar to you guys. Um, so to speak on our current jail, which you see right there, we must begin by talking about where we started. Um, and as I listen to you guys' presentation, uh, there are a lot of eerie similarities. Our jail was originally built in 1952 um, on the third floor of our courthouse. Um, and it stayed on the third floor of our courthouse for 58 years. Don't worry, we did additions too. Um, we actually did four additions, uh, one in 1973, 1984, 1989, and 
Um, so we did the same thing that you guys have done. We were a long, linear style of jail, um, encompassed the entire third floor of our courthouse. Uh, these additions were designed around the current courthouse configurations, not what made sense for jails, for jail design, for staffing efficiencies, or security. It was truly form driven the function of the inside of the building. Um, we turned our jail into a long linear jail. Uh, offices were created out of room closets. Um, we repurposed old locker rooms for programming areas. In, in, inmate movement, as is talked about already, went right down the middle of everything. Um, if you needed to move an inmate from point A to point B in the jail, you took them right past the kitchen, right past booking, right past the main desk. Um, it was inefficient and not safe. So what did we do to, to create <coughs> this new jail? Um, like you guys have done, we've done jail tours, countless jail tours, um, learning about what was good and what was bad. Um, we created committees and subcommittees and had more meetings and more meetings. Um, we did presentations um, to both the city, uh, the county, um, local advocacy groups, no different than you guys are doing and have done. We heard not downtown, we heard not next to our river, we heard not next to our school, we heard not next to our park, we heard not in my backyard. The same concerns, right? Our jail, like your jail, has been on the third floor of the courthouse, downtown, next to the river, since 1952. This is not a new property. It's always been downtown. And why downtown? I'll get to why downtown, um, but we're going to talk a little bit more about um, why. Uh, so we studied jail workflow. Um, bringing stuff up to the third floor was inefficient, from people to food to supplies. So we knew a new jail could not be built on the third floor. Um, so for the first time, function dedicated our design um, and, and driven our design. We designed our jail oversized in those core areas that you can't change again. Booking, kitchen, laundry, programming. Those are all built and designed for growth. Because it's coming. It has to, it has to come. Because we have not figured out a way to slow our rate of incarceration. No amount of diversion, no amount of treatment. We're not there yet. We're still trying. It's not one or the other. Both have to happen. You have to do both. It's not a jail or programming. You need to do both. Um, so why did we do it? Like you guys, we were hemorrhaging money out of county. Chip one done. Um, almost a million dollars a year to send people to other counties. Just merely for a bed um, and for space. Um, the, the nightmare, and I'm sure we'll talk about it again here, but the, the nightmare truly of transporting people back and forth and trying to figure out who's got court this day, what branch, what time, and you have 85 of them in different counties. Um, I can only liken it to being a parent and having to run kids from one sporting event to Boy Scouts to Girl Scouts to Cub Scouts. Um, you don't know which way you're going, and the, the stress and the, the security concerns of bringing people back and forth um, is a daunting task. So the conversation turned from when are we going to do it to where are we going to do it? Where is the new jail going to go? And um, there was many designs, and there was many locations picked out. Um, there was downtown. There was not downtown. There was out in the middle of nowhere in Eau Claire County. Um, and so eventually, we did an advisory referendum on the location. Um, and that location ultimately designed what was downtown. Um, and it made the most sense, because downtown is where all the resources are at. That's where our human services is at. That's where our hospitals are at. That's where the courtrooms are at. The interaction daily between jails and courts is nonstop. I have a three-page court list of who's going to court today, and to try to transfer them from a different county back and forth would be not efficient. So when we finally did build downtown, um, we brought all our inmates back, which saved us some money. And it solved the old jail design, the long linear layout. It increased um, our programming space and availability. It increased our overall safety and security of our building. 
and also reduced those hidden areas and the, the staff intense transporting and moving people around. Um, so why downtown again? The courts are downtown, human services downtown, all the other community supports are downtown. So in closing, I'm going to make this brief. Um, jails are an important thing for a community. And it's a great undertaking that you have to decide on. I'm going to give you the board an open invite. If you haven't toured our facility, I'd like you to. It's important to see. But first, I need some homework from you guys. Tour your current jail. Talk to your current staff. Not at, you know, two in the afternoon. Doesn't matter. Three in the afternoon, two at night. Talk to your staff. Talk to the men and women who are on the floor on a daily basis, how you interact and deal with people from our community. And talk to them about the stress of their job. Talk to them about the layout and the flow. And then come to us. We spent a lot of time on our design, um, and it's a solid design, and we won't change anything. We would add a couple of things, and we talked to your committee uh, about adding floor drains in certain areas or outlets. I mean, that's, that's the minutia that we talked to your jail committee about. Um, but the overall design by, by Venture Arch is a solid design. Um, the pictures that you saw in there, that was the Eau Claire County Jail. Um, so if you, if you are a bricks and mortar and need to see it kind of person, come on up. Come on over. I'd be happy to talk with you um, at any point in time. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. So um, in closing, as a jail ad hoc committee, we wanted to make a recommendation to the county board uh, after all of our work and research. And the jail ad hoc committee um, recommends bonding for $58 million over 20 years to build a new jail with the goals of reducing recidivism, increasing community safety, reducing our long-term costs, and improving the health and well-being of our community. We know that it's not popular to build a jail. No one wakes up one day and says, you know, I want to be known for building a jail, but we honestly believe that this is in the best interest of our community and of our staff. Uh, at this time, I guess we'll open it up to questions. I'll, I can take some and, and we have a whole crowd also. So yeah, I'm going to open this up to questions from the board and then we'll, we'll follow that with public comment or any questions that we might have there. Uh, Supervisor Rosen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I was looking at these pictures. There's a lot of flat roof space. Was there any discussion about putting solar panels on top of that roof? There was discussion, yes. Um, and maybe, I think Kurt can help me out a little bit with this. It did come up. Um, the ROI on solar panels is something that would be long, t quite long term. Maybe he can help me out. <laughs> It's always a question about um, solar panels and what's the payback. And what I told the committee is that we don't want to just uh, say no right now, but when you get into the next level of design, actually do an energy model. Uh, and what that does is it will put together what those panels cost would be and then what the return would be. So there's actually a software program that when John's team gets to the next phase of design, we can definitely make that a priority and then let the committee, whoever, or the full board make that decision. Typically in this region, the ROI on that is pretty long. Um, now there are some counties that don't care. They're gonna invest and they want to see uh, that that uh, component of the project is included. But the ROI that I've seen has been in excess of 15 years and some of them are close to 20. Um, some people decide that that's good. <coughs> so, well definitely we could include that in the, in the design. Yeah, I asked a follow-up question. Yeah, I was. I mean, the, my thought about that was um, whether there'd be some. Because you talked a little bit about federal grants and what might be available to help with the cost. I, I didn't know exactly what maybe focus on energy money might be there to help with that, and uh, whether there might be some other avenues of revenue. Yeah, part of that energy model is to get focus on energy and other um, opportunities for funding included in there uh, to be able to offset some of that. So that would be included in that ROI in regards to what's your true investment versus where you could find other, other dollars for that. So that's part of that energy model process. Yep. More questions from the board? Any other? Mr. President? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, I, I don't want to spend money. Um, I, the one thing I was really impressed with was the depth of, of not only what the committee did, that is, it is truly a deep dive, and I want to congratulate you on that. That was a great job. And the, uh, the, the, and the finance part of it, there are a couple of things that always irritate me that are not shown, but this time they were shown. <laughs> And basically, the, I hope when they show you your debt service numbers, they always zero out in some year because it looks like they're making an assumption that you're never going to borrow another dime for as long as you live. And we know from experience that's not true. We're going to be going through CIP here very shortly. It's the same thing. I'm glad to see that they made a provision in the, in the estimates for the uh, inclusion of up to $3.5 million per year in additional bonding that might go on. I think it, rather than go on and extend any length about, I, I think I took, I had comments and notes on every page here, but rather than go through that, I just want to tell the committee that I think you've made a compelling argument. And I think as much as I am scared of that number, I think I'm going to have to support this because it does make sense. And I think the thing that isn't emphasized nearly enough is, is that it's not what happens while the inmates are in jail, it's what happens when they get out. And that's a big thing. And if this can help us make sure that those trips to the county jail are a one-time deal as opposed to a recurring thing so that we have no frequent flyers, I think that that's something that the community needs and it's important to do. So in short, I think I should say I'm convinced. So thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Wagner. Supervisor Clementing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to know if this would be available to the public you know, or our municipalities that would like it or a presentation of that sort. Yes, and I'll try to answer that as well as the video. Yeah, the video is going to be posted hopefully. Um, um, River Cities or Wisconsin Rapids Community will have that all this afternoon. I can PDF this. Um, uh, PowerPoint presentation, and I can put that on the meeting page as well, so we can get that out. And it'll go to Marshfield also. We'll make contact with uh, Tom Lux, the communications director for the city of Marshfield. Yes. And we're going to link this everywhere. We so do we also have a town hall scheduled for May 26th at uh, Wisconsin Rapids Area Middle School at 6 p.m. We're talking about doing one in Marshfield and potentially Pittsville as well. Yet to be determined. Additional questions or comments from the board? Supervisor Winch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, it seems to be deep. We don't know when it's going to end, but that ends it all the way as part of the county prisoners. Is that correct? That would end all of your out of county prisoners? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, right. Yes. The goal here is not it's not to take in inmates from other counties. It's just to keep all of our inmates locally. That is something if we were to have the available availability and capacity in the future that we can discuss, but that's not the goal here. You don't know when that's going to end. When we'll go back to normal both of our now. Oh, after COVID? Yeah. No, I don't think we have any I need an estimate on that. And why are we using a uh, project manager for the job? Why are we using a project manager? Right. So we can, save money. yeah, to save money. So we can get. And how is it you going to save us money? Well, a project manager can, I mean, we don't have the ability to do this in house manage this project. I mean, we don't have anyone on our team who can hire contractors, take I don't care. believe that. Hmm. That's, I appreciate the, the, the comment and opinion, but I, mm -hmm. yeah, the expertise in common is pretty tough to get. So, Roger Fire? I'd like to make a comment. The, the Marshfield has built about, what, four or five buildings lately? Yeah. I got, okay, he gets a shock look on the <laughs> <laughs> And they were all, we started with the fire department and we did a project manager and we've done it ever since. The thing about a project manager or manager over a construction company is all savings that comes across comes back to the project. It doesn't, 
It, it, it doesn't go in pockets. So you'd be surprised the money you can save. And if you get to a point where you have to value something and you want to change, well, Bill, I'm sorry. I understand that you and I won't agree on this, but I know for a fact that the five projects we had did save us money and were valued. I would, I would never go back to just without a project manager. It just, and the bids come in when you, when you bid the thing, you just bid it. Your, your bid project could be who knows, 200, 200 bidders. And, and you go through the whole thing and you can really get the value out of a project manager. So it is it is a need when you're building something that's worth $60 million. Yeah, in my opinion, if we're spending $56 million, we want to hire someone with the experience to do that kind of work. We don't have anyone in-house who's built a $56 million project. Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> no, no, no. Additional questions. Supervisor Clendenin, I see you're ready to go there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> One of the comments I heard, and, and I don't know if it can be answered today, is, well, now you get a new jail just like uh, other counties had. You get a new jail, now the state's going to require you to house some of their temporary people for a while or something like that. Uh, I know we're not building that for this, but does the state have control over such a thing? And, and we, uh, we take in prisoners? Because I know I've served on the board a while, and I know we've had requests for those things. So if that could be answered, I think, you know, to the public. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, the state doesn't mandate anybody to do that. You can enter into contracts with them if you so choose. Uh, COVID, on the other hand, has caused a, an oddity for the state of Wisconsin where prison system closed. So we ended up having 32 people here at Wood County Jail that should have been to prison but stayed. And in that respect, you're correct that they can control some things, but normally you enter into contracts with them to the jail. Any additional questions for the board? I think about it. Again, said it before, I can't thank you enough. This was not a cursory look. This is an extremely deep dive. So, Laura, you know, you're under your leadership and the, the committee there, Supervisors Joe Holcamp, Bride, Tao, LaFontaine, and Han, as well as the entire staff uh, and outside consultants who participated. We have a really deep dive into this, as Supervisor Wayne said. So <laughs> there'll be additional questions, I'm sure, at the public information meetings. And one of the concerns we had when we went into this is provide as much information as we can to the entire community. Uh, so we can really lay out the need. You know, we discussed this. I think I'm echoing somewhat what Supervisor Wagner said. I'm not really in favor of spending a lot of money on it. Uh, on the other hand, we looked at this 20 plus years ago, and I made the comment at that time, at some point these lines will cross, and something's gonna have to happen. Uh, we were able to look, delay that for 20 plus years, but I think we've reached a crossroads, and I just can't thank you for providing the depth of information you had. So if I don't have any other questions from County Board Supervisors, I'm going to open up the public comment period. When that's over, we will take a five-minute break, okay? Supervisor Ashbeck, I believe you have a question, comment? Well, I just want to make one comment on this because when you, when you, a future on the dairy farm is never dependent on rented land. You have to own your land in order to, do, so have, a, to have a future for it. And here we're renting from other counties all the time, so it really is on our future. Um, you know, we, we have to we have to own our own in order to to uh, be progressive or to come out ahead. So. Thank you. I guess on the presentation, Laura, thank you. I know you put this together, and we had a lot of help along the way. But I can't thank you and the committee now. So <laughs> appreciate it. Uh, as we move forward for the next month. All right, public comment. Do I have any public comment today? Uh, anybody from the public is allowed to identify themselves and. Up to three minutes. Oh, excuse me. Time. Is there any public comment? Any public comment? All right. Seeing no public comment, the county clerk is requesting we take a wait. How long? How long break do you want, Trent? Break. Yeah. How long? Break. Ten minutes. Yeah. A ten minute break. I expect to be back here at five after. Please. Thank you. Oh, Referrals for me. Uh, I should know the answer to this. Uh, Supervisor Condeni has been appointed to the. Resolution and Laws Committee for the Wisconsin Counties Association. Bill, when do we have to have all those in? Is it the 21st of June? 21st of June. 21st of June. I should have done that for sure. So stay in touch with Mr. Clendenin. Page 6 in your packet. Operations Committee minutes, April 20th. Page 7 and 8, their minutes from May 4th. 
Monthly letter of comments from the clerk on nine. Update from Human Resources Department, pages 10 through 15. From the Treasurer's Office, 16 and 17. Heather, did we get our first deposit? Not yet? Checks in the mail? Okay, that's seven point some odd mil. All right, employee wellness on 18. And then that brings us to the first resolution in the packet brought forth by the Operations Committee. Will the clerk please read the resolution. This will be resolution 21-5-1 to accept the offer of sale of tax deed property. Fiscal note, offered amount of $1,800 results in a break even for the county. I have a motion to approve by Hamilton, a second by Wagner. Any discussion? Any discussion? I'd ask you to please vote. Thank you. That resolution passes unanimously. Back to the packet, page 20, Health and Human Services Committee meeting of uh, April 22nd. That's 20 and 21. Update from the Health Department, pages 22 through 25. Update under Director of Ruins, our birthday boy, one of them. Uh, beginning at 26, going through 33, page 26 through 33. Any questions on that? Veteran Service Officers monthly update on 34 and 35. Minutes of the Wood County Public Safety Committee beginning on 36, running through 40. That's their April 12th meeting. Various reports from the Humane Officer uh, from 221 to 43, and that's pages 41 to 48. 41 to 48. We have various reports from the Sheriff's Department. There are monthly reports beginning on page 49, and they run all the way through page 67. A lot of these are jail numbers and other things you have seen previously today. 49 through 67. Any questions there? Minutes of the Conservation Education Economic Development Committee of Tuesday, April 20th, on 68. Their regular monthly meeting on May 5th, beginning on 69. And running through page 73. Golden Sands Resource Conservation Development Council uh, minutes. The Personnel Finance Committee begins these. Uh, the regular board meetings starting March 18. Those run pages 74 to 82. Any question on the Golden Sands? The Wood County Land Information Council minutes. From Tuesday, April 29th, on 83, 84, and 85. Update for UW Extension begins on 86 and runs through 92, 86 to 92. The staff reports for land and water conservation beginning on 93 through 97. The minutes of the seat committee, I'm sorry, the, the monthly staff report from planning and zoning beginning with uh, Director Grunenberg at 99 through 103. 99 through 103. Citizen groundwater meeting of Monday, April 19th, 104 and 105. And then I have the various economic development recovery meetings that have taken place and I want to thank people for around the community, uh, in fact, around the entire county for participating in these. Uh, they run from 326 to 422, and that's pages 106 to 111. And then that takes me to 112 in the packet, and that is a resolution from the seed and judicial legislative committees. This will be resolution 21-5-2 to oppose changes in the wildlife damage abatement and claims program through Senate Bill 63 and Assembly Bill 49, which eliminates any local county control of the program and instead gives all authority to the state government officials. Fiscal note, none. I have a motion by Supervisor Hamilton, a second by Supervisor Fire. Any discussion? Is there any discussion? Please vote. And that was 17-1, um, that resolution passes.
Back to the packet. Page 113 begins the minutes of the Judicial and Legislative Committee of May 7th. Page 113 through 116. Yeah. Supervisor Clinton. Yes. I, I would like people to note on page 115, <coughs> number all, number 13. I, oh, on number, number, number 11. It says, motion by Lightman, seconded by Clendenning to reimpose the county's mass mandate <coughs> in the county buildings. This, and there was a discussion had, and it was four, four and one supervisor voted against it. Uh, and, I, and I don't know why there's not a resolution in the packet. But uh, I, I, my, my purpose for putting that on the agenda is the fact that uh, you, Mr. Chairman, had uh, given a directive on masks in, in Wood County uh, buildings, and it was a resolution from the Judicial Legislative Committee and it went to you and you made the decision on what to have the mask mandate. And then when the governor was, uh, was by the Supreme Court said no to that, then it was automatically done, and I believe it was done by you, that, that uh, we should not wear masks. We don't have to wear the mask. And, and, I, and I disagreed with that because the county board is the one that said yes to doing that, and uh, I think they should have the right to say no to it. And I've had a lot of calls, and, and there are people here that uh, uh, in, in the public today was supposed to be here. Yes, and then with that, our last meeting about it, and I heard a lot of conversations. And I would still like to have the county board vote on whether they want a mask mandate or not. And why I think it's so important that we have a mass mandate is the fact that up in, right here in this room right now, if there was court today, everybody in this courtroom would have to have a mask on it because the Supreme Court told the district courts that they had to have masks. So if they have to have masks and the Supreme Court made that decision, I, I, I think when it comes to the county, and the county said you have to wear a mask in this building, I think the county board should say no, you don't. So I, I, I would like to make a motion to reimpose the, the mask uh, that you had presented to it. And I would hope I would get a second. I was surprised, as you were, that there was a resolution back because I assumed there might be, and then I thought maybe because of the uh, latest information from the CDC and the President of the United States that maybe that got pulled. Uh, I had no idea uh, why it wasn't here. But so, are you making a you want to run that right now? Yeah. No. Yes, I do. <clears throat> Super. Uh, let me go to Peter Kassenholz. Peter, I know what you're doing. I pay him to tell me. <laughs> Peter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is supposed to be about a resolution. Um, so uh, that's just the way it works. So if there's any fault for there not being a resolution in the packet, it's probably mine. Um, I take the minutes, um, I argue with the committee and ask questions of the committee with regards to what should be in the, in the minutes um, and the motions and so on. But I did not prepare a resolution here. But if you want to prepare one next month, I will, or take some other action. Um, Technically, the county board chair, if it's an emergency under 323, 11, and 14 of the stats, could take action on their own um, during the course of the next month. If that was deemed necessary. That's so, all. All right, I'm going to probably need you for another ruling, too. <laughs> so, I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, last month, the same thing happened. Uh, about six, eight years ago, <coughs> I'm a chairman of the Judicial Legislative Committee, and we, we wanted a resolution to get in the packet. And we were told we were nine minutes late on a Wednesday, where they have to be in there. We were nine minutes late, and we could not do it. But last month at our meeting, we had a thing on our table, nothing in the packet, on our desk in front of us, not, nothing in the packet, and that was the last thing we did was pass your uh, directive about the beer development. 
And, and that, I thought, should have been by resolution too. I thought it should have been in a packet prior to it. So I think it, unless there's a motion from somebody to, to, that my motion that I just made now, and it was seconded. I did. Yes. Correct? Let me, let me back up. Okay. First of all, is that appropriate? You're going to say no, it has to be by resolution. Well, the, you can make a motion procedurally, and you can second it, and you can vote on it. Um, are you doing things wrong? Yes. Um, because in the end, you end up with a document that I believe not to be legal. Um, that or a motion that's not legal because it's supposed to be by resolution or by stance. But I, I don't run the show around here. You folks do. So I keep that in mind. Yeah, with a lot of advice. Um, so I, I think the, if that's the case, you'd have to suspend the rules, basically, first, wouldn't you? No, so you'd have to suspend the statute because right. you don't have the authority. Let me back. All right, I've got a, I have a motion apparently that's for rising on that, and I don't believe I have a second yet. Yes, you do. Hamilton? Yeah. Okay, up on the board. All right, I'll go to discussion. Supervisor Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just noticed that uh, uh, the uh, the meeting at which this occurred, uh, that Mr. Clinton is referring to, and upon which his motion is premised, uh, was on May 7th. And since that time, the CDC has released a new directive that uh, basically those persons who are fully vaccinated or don't have to wear that inside or outside. Um, does that does that color the vote, or should it be taken into well? I suggest that if we're going to vote on this, that the supervisors take that into consideration because the rules have changed since this the, the meeting of the Legislative and Judiciary Committee. Thank you. Uh, other discussion? I, I, go ahead. I'm going to go to Trent here real quick. I think your question might be mine. What is it? Yeah, what I, I guess all I have is three words. Reimpose mass mandate. I, yeah. Is there an ending? Is there uh, The one that was created at such and such a meeting. No, I, I, I can't remember the date of that meeting when we did impose the mass mandate. the resolution. Okay. On this resolution. And that's resolution 2012-14 that says the intent is to approve a mass mandate use policy in county owned buildings. What resolution is that, Supervisor Clendenning? 20-12-14. Does that make sense to you? Item number 5-3. It does make sense, but there was an ending on that resolution, was there not? And I'm asking, is your motion included an ending to this mass mandate that you're proposing? That resolution had one in there, and it stated when okay. the governor's order went down, the mass mandate would end. So I'm, just, I'm asking for clarification on your motion. I did not know. I did forget that that was in there. Yes, you're right. Okay, it says, now therefore be it resolved to approve the implementation of the attached emergency directive on the use of a face mask in county-owned buildings until the expiration of the order directed public use of face masks by a Governor Evers or other such action. I will withdraw my motion. <coughs> I don't think that's... No, no, no it's not. <laughs> Why don't somebody just table it indefinitely? <laughs> All right, I would entertain a motion to table indefinitely by Supervisor Wagner, a second by Supervisor Fire. All right, can I do this by voice vote? Trent? All right, all in favor signify by aye. Aye. Opposed? No. All right, let's do this Hold on. on the board in a minute. Maybe you got the majority, yes. Here, it's the majority. I would know. You just you guys just talk loud? <laughs> we all had masks up, you didn't hear us. You can't hear because we shot people, and I can hear because we did. Right, just do this by show of hands first, and that doesn't work. Oh my God. Uh, no, they can wait. Mr. Chairman, for not having that illegal vote, because we have been the first 19 to use uh, space in the new jail. <laughs> I agree. See, a presidential motion to indefinitely postpone 
is what we had in motion by Wagner, second by fire. All right, so I have this motion to indefinite postpone, which basically kills this. Um, the motion is by Supervisor Wagner, the second is by Supervisor Fire. Is there any discussion on that? I don't even know if that's a debatable motion. I have a little card from me. Just a bullet. All right, I'd ask you to please. So a yes vote is to indefinitely postpone, indefinitely postpone, which would kill that argument. <coughs> The yeses have it that is indefinitely postponed. And you know, just to the point though, we'll, we'll continue to follow the guidance. And if we have a situation where we, we've got something that's to supervise your plan, point, 9, 10, 11, 12 minutes late, an hour, get into the packet, we, we'll make arrangements to get those taken care of. So the clerk may kill me for saying that. But no, there's, there's rules that say you have until Friday. There was no resolution that came through my office. You have until Friday per pursuant to county board rules to get a, a late uh, a late resolution in the packet. Okay. Pages 113 to 116. The minutes of the Judicial Legislative Committee. Up in there. Comments from the county clerk, 117 through 120. Notice of injury and claim, 121 to 125. Comments from the Child Support Agency on 126, from Corp Council on 127, and then that brings us to page 128 and a resolution brought forth by a judicial and legislative. This will be resolution 21-5-3 to go on record in requesting the state of Wisconsin to strengthen its hate crime statute, Wisconsin statute section 939.645, so as to provide enhanced security to members of Wisconsin's marginalized communities. And I have a motion by LaFontaine, a second by Supervisor Hamilton. Is there discussion on this resolution? Any discussion? Please vote. That resolution passed unanimously. Thank you. Back to the packet, page 130. 131 and 132 are all from the Highway Infrastructure Recreation Committee, May 6th. We have an update from the Highway Commissioner on, on their monthly activities on 133 through 138. The Park and Forestry Department reports beginning on 139 and running through 143. And then is there any objection to me taking these two uh, resolutions which we always take together, which are additional funding for snowmobile trail maintenance and development. Any objection taking these two together? Seeing none, will the clerk please read those two resolutions? This will be resolution 21-5-4. To become eligible for 2022 snowmobile trail development monies for the proposed bridge to be replaced on the trails of the Auburndale Night Owl Snowmobile Club. Fiscal note, no cost to Wood County. Total reimbursement from state snowmobile aid account. Resolution 21-5-5, to become eligible for the 2022 snowmobile trail maintenance monies for the proposed addition, additional 2.5 miles of snowmobile trail for the Bakerville Snow Rover Snowmobile Club. Fiscal note, no cost to Wood County, total reimbursement from the state snowmobile aid account. I have a motion by LaFontaine, a second by Hamilton. Is there any discussion on either of these? Any discussion? All right, I would ask you again to please vote. Again, those passed unanimously. Back to the packet. Page 146 begins the minutes of the Property and Information Technology Committee of May 3rd. It's 146, 7, and 8. Uh, update from the IT department beginning on 149 and running through 152. 149 through 152. Monthly letter of comments from our facilities manager on 153. Central Wisconsin State Fair Board, uh, a director's meeting from March 15th on 154 and 155. The Illinois Memorial Library Minutes, 156 and 157, that's our March 17th meeting. Our April 14th meeting on 158. 
their April 21st meeting, 159, 60, and 61. They have the South Central Library System Board of, or Board of Trustees minutes on 162 and 163. Minutes from the University uh, Commission meeting on 164 and 165. And then the Jail Study Ad Hoc Committee minutes of April 15th on 166 and 167. I know I ran through those pretty quick. Does anybody have any questions on any of those that we ran through? Supervisor Clendenning. I'd just like to commend the Jail uh, Study Committee in, in the presentation today. I know it was lengthy. But it, it was great. I, I, just, I just think it's great what they, they, they have done. And then I, I, I go to them as many meetings of them as I can. And how they've gathered that information and put it together to me was outstanding. Thank you. Supervisor Clendenning. Is there anything else that needs to come before this board today? And that meeting date is June 15th, June 15th. All right, seeing nothing else, I will declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you.